So the request for food justice in, in, in the uh, face of finite resources. I'm going to introduce each speaker and ask them a, a, a question. And then after I've done that, uh, we're going to open it up to you all. So uh, 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 please have your, your thoughts and questions ready. I'll start with, 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 with Dr. Chappelle in the middle, uh, Jai Chappelle. Chappelle? Chappelle. Chappelle. Uh, uh, Assistant Professor of, the, of Environmental Science and Justice at the School of the Environment at Washington State University. Uh, 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 he got his PhD from the University of Michigan. Uh, uh, you are a uh, political ecologist, which is a great title. Um, so um, there are going to be more people on the planet over the next 50 years, you know, another 2 billion or so. Uh, but perhaps more to the point, people are getting richer. Um, you know, China and India alone last year both saw 10% uh, in income growth. Um, and that means that people are spending a lot more on food, which means not only are they eating more, but they're eating sort of uh, more expensive. They're eating more meat uh, and so on. Meanwhile, most of the world's uh, uh, very poorest people, uh, those living on $1.25 a day, are still uh, uh, rural. Um, and in some ways, that suggests an opportunity, right? I mean, uh, all of these very poor rural people, uh, many of them, their primary income is from farming, and there's going to be more demand for food. Um, and yet, uh, we're seeing increasing rates of, uh, increasing numbers of, of, of the very poor living in, in, in urban areas. Um, and even those uh, very poor people in rural areas are both producers uh, of food, but also consumers of food from elsewhere. Um, climate change is going to make all of this even more complicated. So what do we do? Well, OK, so you're going to have to be a general question. <laughs> uh, what do we do? Well, uh, I want to start with uh, challenging sort of some of the framing, which is basically what political ecologists do. Um, I'm actually, by training, an agroecologist, conservation biologist, but uh, my question always was, when I started grad school, like, how do we fix things? And it seemed to me very quickly apparent that we had far more possible solutions from the science and the technology than we'd ever tried. And we don't know which ones are going to work. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Lehman earlier was mentioning you know, we need different farmers, we need different things. The uh, gentleman from Rodeo Institute said the same thing. And getting through and trying these things and studying how they work is, is really the constriction point. Um, and so I really focus sort of what you could call social technology. I know it's sort of a jargony term, but you know, how do we look at policy systems? How do we work with people? And the thing that is often, to me, missing at these uh, kinds of conversations are the people, communities. You know, farmers are a very, very important constituency, and they don't have enough representation of this type of thing. I'm glad we have at least some farmers here. But there's also consumers, poor consumers. You know, we're having a conversation about them rather than with them. And we can't solve our problems in that way. And so one of the key issues, uh, as far as that goes, in terms of the population growth, I've got a colleague, uh, Anne Laramore, who's a scholar in uh, African studies and, and women's studies. And every time in our group at, at Mis University of Michigan we would discuss population, she said, I really insist that you guys don't just say we're going to have 9 billion people, because that assumes the continued oppression of a certain number of women. Because you see when women have more rights, more education, more political representation, childbirth in general goes down as well as nutrition goes up. Uh, productivity tends to go up in terms of rural uh, uh, women. And so if you assume 9 million, you're just assuming like, OK, well, we're going to just allow that repression to continue. And you know, it's not going to be easy, but neither is you know, splitting the atom or putting genes in new plants. And so from my point of view, you know, focusing on how we change our social systems, which we know are changing, but we're very different today 50, 50 years than 50 years before, 50 years before that. And we know societies are changeable, but it's hard and it's not exact. You know, we'd like to be able to come up here if you're at a big conference, you want to say, if you do X, Y will happen. Um, the Nobel laureate, Eleanor Ostrom, who won the uh, uh, Nobel Prize in Economics for her work on uh, basically how local institutions can be very, very sustainable. Uh, she never says it's the solution. She never says, if you go local, it'll work. It just raises your odds. And you know, academics hate that. You want to say, no, it'll work. This is how you do it. <laughs> But so I mean, I think that there's a huge emphasis on technical sol solutions because these other solutions, you can't just guarantee it. You have to work with the community. You have to have the people there. It takes a lot of more involved work in, in <coughs> groups talking directly to each other. And that's not what we're set up to do in most of our policy systems. 
And so I think there's a lot of potential there. There's a lot of examples of that working. I work in uh, Southeast Brazil, especially. And um, I was just thinking, heading up to this conference, uh, Francis Moore LePay, the, the great food activist, you know, one of the founders of the modern American food movement, uh, said uh, to me years ago, you know, we don't have a scarcity of food, we have a scarcity of democracy. And I thought, well, that's kind of kitschy. That's, yeah, I mean, sure, I agree, but, but only recently have I underst really understood what she meant. You know, if we, th if we think of democracy just in terms of voting, that's one thing. But democracy is also education for everyone. Democracy is also rights for women. Democracy is also, you know, having rural extension support for agriculture, having the tools you need to be an independent citizen. And when you do that, when people have those tools, they tend to have less children, they tend to have higher productivity. So we can do two things at once. Our productivity goes up when people have more education and more equality. So we can do a lot of these things, but we have to focus on working with people and looking at policies as much or, in my opinion, more than the technical solutions in terms of uh, you know, plant breeding. I work at an agri agricultural system, so that's great, awesome technology as well in terms of knowledge technology. You know, those are great, but we need to focus at least as much on working with people and how we do that. Thank you. Uh, Deborah, uh, uh, you're the, the co-founder and, and, and program director of Food Corps, uh, and yourself an organic farmer uh, 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 working in Ohio. Um, so, and, and Food Corps is a non-profit national service organization that seeks to reverse childhood obesity by increasing vulnerable children's knowledge of and engagement with and access to healthy food. Um, so one of the ironies uh, of having a, a discussion on this general topic now is that, of course, um, nowadays there are more people worldwide who are overweight than there are uh, who are uh, malnourished. Of course, in fact, there are some who are both, um, um, uh, you know, especially amongst relatively poor people in relatively rich countries. Uh, too many calories, not enough nutrition is a, is, is, is a, a growing problem. Um, so I guess the question to you is, you know, how do we get uh, more people eating uh, not only enough, but the right stuff? Good question, and thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> I do want to say that I feel bad that Fred only had 15 minutes, so I will try to address his human capital concern that he brought up when he was speaking. Um, but one of the reasons why I co-founded Food Corps is because we do have this dual issue of one in four being hungry and one in three being obese. And that core solution is access. And it goes towards knowledge, engagement, and access leading towards actually having a lifetime habits of, of healthy eating. And um, what I find interesting in being a lot of these discussions and discourses between scientists and politicians and practitioners is, is that we actually have this high need for translation. Like we don't, we don't take what you're studying and discussing in the ivory tower and translating that to the people that are doing it on the ground. And we're not doing it in fun and easy, easily transferable ways. Um, you know, Graham was talking about his documentary, but also something that really struck me was when he said, um, and he is one, he uses the tool of documentary to educate people, but he, since it's a failure of our educational system that he didn't know that potatoes grew under the ground. I mean, what does that say for us as a society? And how many of you um, grew up on a farm in the room here? Already, look at that. Boy, where'd they go? Um, I, I'm the youngest of seven. I grew up on a dairy farm. All I knew until I was 18 was milking cows. That's a society. I didn't know anything else. And I went as far away from farming as I possibly could because I heard there was things such as vacation and salary. <laughs> I was like, wow, a salary sounds delightful. Um, but now here I am. I'm back in my hometown of 900, and I have an organic farm a quarter mile from where I grew up, and I'm surrounded by commodities, corn, and soybeans. And I live the urban-rural divide, and my day-to-day my -day is trying to understand what we're trying to do in commodity agriculture and small, sustainable agriculture. And my day job is trying to make it so everyone has access to healthy food, whether you're in Detroit, or whether you're in Los Angeles, or whether you're in Knoxville, Ohio. And I, I'm here because I think it's a human right to have access to good food, and it shouldn't be that complicated. And it isn't that complicated if you know how to do it yourself and you know how to grow your own food. Thank you. 
Uh, Reginaldo, you, you've worked uh, on, on economic uh, uh, development for Guatemalan indigenous communities since, since the, the 80s. Uh, you were a vice chair of the Fair Trade uh, Federation um, and, and a founder. Um, and you've served as an advisor for, to, to the World Council on Indigenous Peoples. Um, you, you've also uh, co-created a, 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 a coffee company, um, uh, uh, Peace Coffee, um, and, and worked on uh, uh, forestry uh, stewardship projects. Um, we want cheap, cheap, cheap food. Uh, we also want uh, sort of sustainably produced food. Um, we also want small-scale producers in, in developing countries to, to earn more, have a better life, um, and, and we want in, indigenous people to have uh, their, their land rights protected. You know, can we, going forward, uh, have all of this cake at the same time and eat it? Um, or, or you know, is, in fact, the likely course that it's all going to horribly unravel and we're going to get even less of it? We can have the cake, and we can eat it too. In fact, it's the way it was designed. So, bottom line is, the um, movement away from the perennial, the consistent, natural food production system is what gotten us into the troubles we have. And in that process, we created injustice, we created ecological you know, devastation, we put ourselves in a really deep pit uh, where it's really hard to climb out of because the infrastructure, the systems, the power, the politics, the money, and all of that is actually designed to stay in the pit. Uh, so solutions that are coming up don't see the light of day because the, the lead is on. <coughs> and those who see a little bit out um, don't actually get the support that they need to actually flourish. So we stopped that, doing some of that more massively back when, when, when Riga dismantled all of the USDA rural communities infrastructure that were supposed to create more of that diversified uh, system of research and more applied to the farmer and so on and so forth. But the bottom line is there is an original formula for food and agriculture that says on one hand, and this has been discussed in different words, on one side you got just energy. It's nitrogen, it's phosphorus, it's potassium, it's all of those things. You take a plus sign, you add a new set of energy. We, we normally think of sun so that we can photosynthesize, it will change through photosynthesis and processes. All of this uh, energy on one side, you put it over a process of transformation for which we need the soil, we need the tools, we need the people, we need all of this in, in infrastructure and which we have called farming since we have done it 10,000 years, that's all it is. And that equals, at the other end, energy again. Just this energy on this side you can't eat. This energy on this side you can eat. That's calories. The processes that we have put in between, the infrastructure that controls, the infrastructure, the control, and the ownership infrastructure that we have put in place to achieve that, what we have today, is what's wrong. But the cake has always been there. And we're all invited to eat it, except we have set up systems that keep some uninvited and others eat too much of it. And so you end up with all of these other problems. That equation, if we went back to, to the original equation and we brought it to today's reality, it would give us a very fascinating new system proposition and that is what I am into at this time. That new system proposition starts with very, a very simple uh, three-prong strategy. The first one is the, you know, understanding what we don't want to replicate. Like um, you said before, if we don't know where we're coming from and we are, where we're headed to, it's really hard to create a strategic plan. So what did that destination point look like um, and what is affecting our ability to get to there today is three basic things, although there's a lot more and I want to oversimplify it, there's three things that we should and can affect at least one of them. The first one is the fact that we don't hold the conventional system accountable for what it actually does. From the diversity of actual access to food, to the food available, to the diversity of the soil, the ecology, all of those things we don't hold them accountable for, especially for the devastation of the ecology that belongs to all of us. The second one is that we don't, we don't hold the infrastructure accountable for the ownership and the control that it was put in place that creates two, the other two issues. One, cheap labor, which creates the consumer solution that, that food is cheap. And the second one is that when we 
built all of this, we also gave all of the power, or at least over 90% of it, um, uh, to the conventional system and removed it from whatever could come up. <coughs> Those three things have to be changed, but the one that we know has to be changed first for this to be just in the first place is that a sustainable food system that re resembles m closer to that energy equation we're talking about, which you know Fred Kirschman mentioned, um, you know, it takes about 10 units of energy to produce one in the current system today. To bring it back to at least one to one, we need to change one element first that creates a ripple effect, and that is the labor that goes into conventional food that, is, uh, that, that creates the illusion of cheap food. And that is the, the laborer in the farm, the laborer in the factory, and all of those places where people are abused, where all of this condition, the sector that is pretty much invisible to everybody, and, and it's not even talked about in that, even at this level. We haven't even addressed the fact that 80% of the population that works in the food and agricultural system conventionally go home poor. We haven't even talked about it yet. Well, forget about all the places. Let's, let's, see, let, let's look at that place right now. The other piece is that most of those people are good farmers that should be part of this solution and need to be part of the solution. And the third one is that if you look at the landscape, a lot of other things are happening because most of those folks in the U.S. system are Hispanics. And a lot of them are, are new or, um, or um, generational immigrants. I mean, in the context that they have stayed within that cycle of poverty and food and agricultural cheap labor supply infrastructure for a long time. Now, when we fix that, in, the way, in a way that incorporates them into the solution, then we have a lot of folks on the run, and that's the way we need to put this whole thing if we're really going to create, bring an opportunity for the solutions that we are hearing a lot about, which by the way are not new. Most of what we have talked about today have existed for a very long time. If you talk to Martin um, uh, Kleinschmidt, uh, probably his father taught him most of what he knows. If you ask me, my grandfather taught me how to raise free-range chickens. That's nothing new. So that's the, the other proposition. In our proposition, the system we propose is all of these things we talked about, but it, most importantly, it's aligned with that fundamental factor we have to change, the Hispanic family that is eager to produce the food for this country as a beginning point, and then, of course, let's bring everybody on board. But there has to be a linchpin, and we think that's what it is. It's not the technology, it's the politics, is what I'm hearing. Um, yeah, Marsha Johnston. Um, could you just expand? I'm, I'm curious, interesting, I think it's a good point that nobody has touched on, the labor issue. Um, when you talk about bringing in that component, the Hispanic family that wants to grow food, what do you, how do you see that? I'm not sure where you're going with that, that's all. Where do you... Or do you see those people moving into the system, essentially? Give me a time frame. <laughs> How, no, no, no. I mean, 15 uh, minutes uh, to uh, the end of the session, and there will be more questions. No, so. no. So, so we're not responding right away? Yeah, no, please respond. But 30 seconds? 1.45? Well, here's, here's Until what, I get bored. Here's <laughs> what I'm saying. Um, be, because the, a new system proposition is complex in its components, but it's very simple in its, in its actual equation. The equation is what I just described. How we do what we do, for example, in properly balanced um, uh, ecological production systems that maximize the ability of any specific region, any specific place, farm, or whatever, to produce food, also has to maximize the vocation of the individual, the people involved in it. Those two com com combine create the, the, the actual enterprise that you can then start from. For us, that's free-range poultry. So we created a scalable uh, system for free-ranging poultry that incorporates per perennial cropping systems, large-scale soil building, uh, free-ranging for food production, sprouting systems for, so that we can eliminate or reduce the amount of actual feed that is coming into the production system, all of that, but it's also very, very low labor intensive so that we don't end up locked up with inefficiencies that are not acceptable in an scalable proposition. That free range system is now broken down into very specific engineering processes, which include specifications for every single detail so that we can actually train individuals 
by the hundreds or thousands or as much as people want to embrace it. So that is the shortest version of it. But if you want, all of this is now captured into documentation that we are using to start training. We graduated the first class last year. These folks are now going into production. We are now trying to figure out what the scalability equation is for the actual deployment of this. And remember, the reason we, we picked that is because it's compatible with the conditions, economic, social, migration, immigrant status, uh, um, all of the assets in the, in the Hispanic family align with free range poultry because it's got a short lifespan, a short cash flow turnaround, a small scale beginning point. All of those factors had to be incorporated. And now that we have that equation, we can start because livestock is the beginning of the production of an equation that generates energy, not consumes it. Then you can think, of, think about vegetables and other kinds of things because you've got an excess of energy and so on. So I hope that gives you a better sense of it. Can I add my research, uh, a lot of it, like I said, has been in Brazil. And so Brazil right now uh, has a series of, of different movements and policies going on. One of the most famous being the Lana's Rural Workers Movement. Um, and you know, over the past 20 to 30 years, they've created essentially, you could say, 1.3 million new farmers. Not all those people have stayed farmers. But um, the Brazilian constitution, as redrafted, I believe, in 87, said that land has, a social, has to have a socially productive use. It has to do something that's good for society. Land speculation doesn't cut it. And Brazil has huge land concentration. And so as a result of this constitutional uh, 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 rule, over the years, a movement formed to occupy land that was belonged to land speculators, sometimes friends of the government, you know, large business owners, and say, you know, until you redistribute some of the land that's not being used for socially productive use, which farming is productive, speculation is not, until you do that, you know, we're going to occupy this piece of land. And over 300,000 families have been settled. There's other movements that are, are parallel to it. And uh, you know it's, it's not perfect, but the research shows that most of the families that have gone to those farms, they're still uh, below the poverty level, but their income is doubled. Their nutrition is much better. In general, their education is better. The movement also, about five or 10 years ago, just declared ecological agriculture, agroecology be, to be their official uh, method of, of agriculture. Um, they're producing food for local markets. So there's all these, there's a model for that. and and. What, what's interesting is, I mean, that sounds crazy, United States redistributing land, that's not, you know. But, you know, th there was someone who said that, uh, you know, if there's a, a man who's, who's hungry or, or poor and there's land somewhere that, that could be given to him, he sh it should be given to him. And that was Thomas Jefferson. I mean, now, he's not always the most popular founding father. He's been muted from some <laughs> history books I've heard. But, uh, uh, you know, it's not something that's completely new to the national character of the United States, this idea of, you know, if people have the skills and the desire to farm, then they should be supported in doing so. And we know from cases like South Korea that it was a vital part of creating national wealth was land redistribution at the beginning. Yeah. Um, uh -oh, lots of hands. Uh, over there and then over there. Ooh, over there, there, and there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> my name is Martin Apple. I want to thank you for addressing the really primary issue that we came here to discuss, which is the food security and the global climate change because the primary issue is population control. And I'm glad somebody finally got around to addressing it, even showing how to address it in, in part. I would like you to expand a little bit more on how we can all perhaps really get involved in making those things happen rather than just talking about them. And secondly, I want to comment on your energy equation. I, I love that farming system that you've created. But I want you to think about the whole purpose of how we've been designing agricultural systems in this country, which is to get rid of labor and make things machine intensive. For example, if I put a tomato on the shelf of a grocery store, it took 10 calories to produce the four calories you're going to get out of eating it. What we have to be able to do around the world is create a food system that reverses that, maybe gets 10 calories out of one calorie of input of energy, so we need to have systems in which the efficiency is inputs, input of water, input of energy, so that decreased water and energy footprints create the agricultural systems of the future. Can we go, we're, we're going to do three at once, so it's straightforward, yeah. Um, did you, yeah, did you want to, no? Nope. Oh, well, just while the mic is there. I really liked your comment. Um, when you first you, when you first started speaking about um, the fact that uh, I guess maybe poor people or uh, community members um, are not represented, you know, I guess on the panel, 
uh, which makes a lot of sense. So I guess my, com my, my question is, um, given population increases in, uh, I guess, inner city communities, um, not just, or urban communities, not just in, especially in the United States, but globally as well, um, I guess we need more uh, agricultural systems that are um, beneficial to inner city communities. Um, a lot of times, land isn't um, accessible, um, but there is uh, public property space um, that is available. Um, and you have a lot of unemployed people. Um, I work for a program in Washington, D.C., um, Common Good City Farm, um, and I have teach 97 low-income residents how to garden um, and about nutrition and about health. Um, and I'm just one person. But a lot of these people are employed, but they want to learn how to grow food and things like that. So we're going to need, you know, I guess maybe you could speak upon like maybe some type of system um, these urban communities can have in order to grow food, sustain food, um, you know, begin this process of um, employing people. Thank you. And then back there, there we go. And then after this. Hi, <coughs> I'm Wesley Reith with the National Family Farm Coalition based here in DC. And uh, this question is for Deborah, but um, I'd like to hear any comments. And thank you all for sharing your knowledge as well. Um, um, my question is, um, you know, you, we've, a common theme we've addressed is that of this disconnect that our new generation has between us and agriculture. I mean, less and less people are growing up on farms and we've become disconnected from how things grow. Um, and then, so I guess my question is, how do you think we should best accomplish this in the future? How are we going to educate a large population to bring them back to knowing where their food comes from? Is, that, is this a federal education issue? Is this you know, a state or local issue, how, how, what's your solution? How do we best address this? Thank you. Should we just go down the line? Sure, and I'll start. Thanks for the question. Um, and I should probably elaborate on exactly what Food Court is. I jumped right into uh, talking about the farm issues. But that, what your question is, is what we're trying to address. And when, so Food Court is an AmeriCorps program. So we place literally boots on the ground in public schools. And we launched in August 2011, and we've already served 40,000 kids and built around 260 gardens and generated 785 volunteers. And we're, we're working in um, 40 sites in 10 states. And what I hope accomplishes, what the end goal out of this, is that we end up having, you know, we are in uh, all 50 states with 1,000 public service members by 2020 to really have the Peace Corps of school food, if you will. And what I'm seeing, and I apologize, I have a cold, so my Sudafed is impacting my brain a little bit. Um, uh, what, I'm, what I'm seeing in the work that we're doing is that there's this incredible hunger, if you will, for this kind of program. We had over 1,000 applications for 50 spots. That's more competitive than Harvard. It's a 4% acceptance rate. Same thing happened again this year. There were 500,000 applications for the 82,000 AmeriCorps slots. There's a demand for service in the United States, and we're not giving young people an opportunity to serve. And the Kennedy Serve America Act was passed in 2009 to triple the amount of service members by 2017. And right now, the budget's been flatlined. And it's just that we have this beautiful opportunity to use service in America for healthy kids, and we're not doing it. We're not putting the, the, we're not putting the money where our mouth is. And the other thing I wanted to share with that in, in regards to, you know, connecting food and agriculture and the public institution with 32 million people go to school every day, there's this captive audience for, for children to be educated, is that our system right now, it's $147 billion a year for what our, our diet-related diseases cost us as, as just for the United States. Mississippi alone, last year, $900 million dollars in obesity-related health care costs. Really, is it that expensive to, is it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it that hard for us to put a penny more in our school lunch system? It took three years for us to increase the childhood reimbursement rates by six cents. Three years, people. And we're just talking about getting a fresh food onto the cafeteria plate. And if we want to talk about energy and the environment, it takes 50 times the amount of energy to put apple juice on the plate versus an apple. So it's like the simplicity of putting the whole food item in front of the child. And my husband's diabetic. He takes his blood sugar six times a day. Every single test strip is a dollar. 
if 50% of our society is diabetic by 2030 is what we're hearing now, this is an average statistic, consider the cost to society. Instead of investing in Novolog, let's invest in good food and education for our kids. Oh, well, so, so <laughs> yeah. But, I'm a little passionate about that. I know, I, I, couldn't agree, I couldn't agree more, that's wonderful. Um, well, so yeah, whole dissertations can and have been written on population, but uh, to that gentleman's question, I mean, I actually spend a lot of my time yelling at people about overemphasizing population. Um, let's just take climate change. Uh, as of about 10 years ago at least, uh, the United States used 15 times as much oil per capita uh, than India. India has maybe three times as many people, more or less. So we're still using five times as much. Is the problem 1.1 billion Indians using 1 15th as much oil? Or is it one third as many people using 15 times more? And I mean, you know, it's a both and. It's not that we can ignore the entire population of different countries. But if you're about climate change, uh, China has, has uh, become the world's largest emitter. For one thing, okay, they also have uh, over a billion people. You know, we're still pretty far up there, and we have 300 and some million. So, you know, comparing those two, it's important to keep in mind the context. There's a lot more people being supported in China. But even beyond that, there's a great paper in uh, Proceedings of National Academy of Science. Um, I can't remember the exact title. It was something like Un Unequal Ecological Exchange. Around, I want to say 70 or 80 percent of the carbon emissions from China are for products exported to other countries. About 25, 30 percent was the United States alone, I think. I can't remember. But, you know, so is the problem 1.1 billion Chinese emitting carbon gas, 80 percent of that is for our products? You know, that's not just about population. Um, and in terms of food, just, I don't know, was, I, don't, I want to take time from uh, Reginaldo, but, um, you know, uh, most countries in the world have enough food produced within their own borders. There's, there's some exceptions, um, but you know, India alone has more hungry people than all of Africa. Now, you know, they're both problems, but it's not just population, you know, so uh, that, 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 as far as food security. Um, uh, please, please respond quickly, because then I want to come back along the line, and you, you'll get to do this first. Uh, uh, the one policy recommendation for Washington question uh, is, a, is a great one that was asked earlier. I want to do it here, too. So. Uh, how you want to respond, and then your one policy so recommendation. Various questions there. Um, I would say back to what is it going to take? It's all hands on deck. One thing that frustrates the heck out of a lot of us is the, the the lack of actual awareness in the public as to how bad this whole thing is, and the and then on the solution side, the lack of clarity as to what is it going to take to actually make significant strides with the least amount of effort and investment because bottom line is we don't have the investment needed but so we need to maximize it and in that context back to your question here about what a system looks like remember a system of food and agriculture isn't about farming that's the beginning of the system farming is critical yes and you got to start it that's why we started with the enterprise development system because the farmer has to make it first but in the other end is the consumer and in between is a massive infrastructure that we have to re-engage. And that includes the inner city, includes access, includes engaging the population that is most vulnerable first. And then the ones who are already, already well, wealthy and over controlling the system because that is not where the solution will come from. That we can have it guaranteed and you can bet whatever you want on it. One quick policy recommendation for Washington. That is a policy recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> So I didn't get a chance to address that gentleman's question. So luckily, my policy recommendation fits into that too, in terms of access to, to land in the, in the city, um, food systems. There's another innovation started in Brazil, all over the world now, called participatory budgeting, where people are directly involved in budgeting part of the city's well, city, or you could do it at a larger level too, budget through a series of councils where you are directly involved in setting priorities. And it's a lot harder to tell someone, "I'd rather have a stadium than you have roads to their face." <laughs> Mine is that members of Congress have to have dinner together because there is too much bipartisan rancor and I think that the, the left eating the right and the right eating the left and I think when you sit down together it's a lot harder to throw food when you're actually dining together. Great. There we go. Can I get a food? Can I get Here's the thing. I, I want to add the thing seconds. that Fred, Fred mentioned this before, and I, I, I don't want it to be missed. And that is the fact that we can live without a lot, without a lot of things, but not food. 
And remember, food, spirituality, and all of those things that we yearn for in our whole lives and we will do for as long as we exist will always be there. And when that food comes to you in an unjust system, in a way that destroys everything else, your own soul depreciates and your own spirit suffers. And that is a worse disease than everything else that we have seen because it deteriorates the core of who we are. That, I think, would be a, a way to wrap this up because we absolutely need a system and it's urgent. Communal eating of just food. There you go. We're done. Thank you. Thank you very much.